I had thought about changing my message. Uh, actually, this morning I was like, I just don't know if I want to preach that. Uh, I kind of thought about preaching something that I felt like would be more relative to, relevant to our congregation right now and everything. And just to get peace about that, and I said, I need to go back to the series that we're in. And if you remember, it's been a little while, but if you remember, our series here is Revisiting Old Baptist Hobby Horses. Old Baptist Hobby Horses. What I mean by that is something that back in the day, all the Baptists were known for, hey, they're going to preach against this. They stand against that. They don't like uh, these kinds of things. And there are some things that, uh, as far as Baptist, more recent history, particularly independent Baptist, goes that... Uh, uh, you know, certain things that we've been thought of as that group believes this or doesn't believe that. Now, here's what's really interesting about it. I don't know if you know this, but history of independent Baptists has almost been like removed from anywhere. <laughs> you know? And I think that's just the way that it goes. You won't find probably in the history books, you know, 20 years from now, Lord willing, and we're still around 20 years from now, history books probably, you know, won't even know a lot about what happened in the 50s and in the 60s as far as independent Baptists. And it really, the, it's it's unfortunate because the independent fundamental Baptist has a rich history. Uh, I'm talking about just the, the, the recent movements. Now, when we say we're independent fundamental Baptists, we're not really talking necessarily about a movement. We're just saying we're independent. We're not under anyone else's authority. We're Baptist, and we know what Baptist stands for. I won't preach a whole message about that. Uh, and, and, and then we're fundamentalist, okay, which means we stick by the fundamentals or some basic things that we have agreed with, uh, you know, historically. However, we understand as you follow what the world thinks about or what has been written, the literature that's out there in the independent fundamental Baptist movements, there is a group that just kind of existed. Uh, you could follow the history about when people broke from the Southern Baptist uh, convention and they wanted to become independent and you can follow all that and there are some things I've got bookshelves uh, in my office that are just full of old pamphlets you know that were written by independent fundamental Baptist and a lot of books that were written and if you follow back uh, you go back to like the 1800s 1900s uh, you know Baptist was a huge thing and even in the 40s and 50s 1940s 1950s uh, some of the Sunday school classes were like the largest in the in the in the in our nation. Uh, were independent fundamental Baptists, largest congregations, big movements. You had the BBFI one time that was just spreading like crazy, the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And unfortunately, a lot of people are getting away from that. You see a lot of independent uh, uh, independent Baptists are just kind of like becoming non-denominational or moving towards that way, kind of community churches and. And it's unfortunate, even those who call themselves independent fundamental Baptists are kind of trying to erase some of the history and kind of present themselves as something uh, uh, new. If you're not up on all that, that's, that's not really that big of a deal, okay? End of the day, we stick by the Bible. It doesn't matter what a uh, particular movement did or whatever. Uh, but I do, as somebody who grew up independent fundamental Baptist churches most of my life, uh, and seeing that and studying that, going to Bible colleges that were rich in history of some independent fundamental Baptist. In fact, when I went to Bible college in Springfield, I uh, had the privilege of taking a guy to work every morning for a little while uh, who was Art Wilson. Okay, and you might not know him, uh, but Art Wilson in, in the circles in Kansas and in Oklahoma, some places like that, he was a big name, independent Baptist preacher. Uh, just kind of has a rich history, started a lot of churches and all that. And I remember as a young Bible college student, these were like my heroes. You know, I was like, oh, man, this is just, this is just the greatest thing. And then uh, married into a family, rich, ba independent Baptist history. My wife's dad uh, uh, um, was uh, Ross Fight. I mean, her, her grandpa was Ross Fight, who was a missionary, uh, kind of well-known among a lot of independent Baptists. And her uh, grandpa on the other side, A.F. Collins, you know, kind of had a rich history as well around here and for Scott and then in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And I just I just loved it. I loved that movement. I love reading uh, there uh, some things that they said and, and, and defending, if you will, defending some of the things that they taught that others were like, oh, hey, independent Baptists, you know, are so crazy. I was reading this article in prep, preparing for this sermon. Uh, where these people were talking about independent fundamental Baptists. Even somebody who I, I recognize the name, 
a, a guy who, um, anyway, as an independent fundamental Baptist, and he was on one of these uh, sites that you go online where somebody asks a question, and I guess anybody can answer. I don't know the name of the uh, that kind of a page, but and he answered a question, which I'll get to here in a little bit in the sermon. And he answered a question, and it started up this whole thing about how independent fundamental Baptists are notorious for like making up their own doctrines and acting like they're in the Bible, and they're just real negative towards independent Baptists. And so what's happened over the years, it seems like to me, a lot of Baptist preachers have gotten away from preaching things that they used to preach because they're not popular anymore. That's going to turn people away. We shouldn't preach those kind of things. People get offended. They won't want to come to church. I mean, those are the kind of things that they say. And so I'm looking at a lot of watered-down preaching nowadays that I'm like, that is not the independent Baptist preaching, you know, that I heard 20 years ago. You know, and that's not uh, what I'm reading about when I read these pamphlets and these these messages that were written by great men of God, you know, and I got tons of, you know, John R. Rice and, and Oliver B. Green and all these, the, these old independent Baptist names but, you know, and again, I'm going to say this, none of that really matters because what we go by is what the Bible says. But it's interesting to me to think, okay, let's revisit some of these things that they used to preach about, these things that we kind of got a bad name about. Why were they preaching these? Should we still preach them? You know, what, what, what were these things? Because I don't think they should die out. You know, so we've talked about a few of these popular things. Uh, last one we talked about was the, uh, 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 the authority of a man in the submission of a woman, something along those lines. That's something that used to be preached about a lot, not popular nowadays. And so, uh, and so tonight, the message I'm going to preach, it might seem a little strange, might seem like it doesn't really fit to any of us, but uh, tell me if this title doesn't sound like one of those pamphlets that you would have found uh, from an independent fundamental Baptist uh, <laughs> a, a preacher. Dating, dancing, and drive-in movies. And that doesn't sound just like it's out of the 1950s, independent fundamental Baptist. <laughs> Dating, dancing, and drive-in movies. But we don't even have drive-in movies anymore. Well, it started with a D, so I picked it, okay? <laughs> but going to the movies and all that kind of stuff. All right. <clears throat> I put these all into one category. They could be treated separately, but I put them together because I feel like they all, uh, they all deal with the same thing. They're all from the same place, if you will. Dating. What does that mean, dating? All right. I don't mean the whole process of of somebody liking somebody else and kind of getting together and deciding, hey, we want to be a couple or something. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm talking about specifically going out on dates, as you would think about it. Let's go back to, again, 1950s, where you would have heard some of these things preaching, uh, preached. Maybe you've seen uh, movies or something that are geared towards that time frame or old uh, sitcoms or something like that from the 50s. And you think about how they, uh, you know, things that were going on in that culture or whatever. We're revisiting some of those ideas. And, you know, dating, going out on dates is nothing new. People have always done that, taking uh, their girlfriend out on a date, whatever. And, uh, and this is something that's been around for a long time. But people used to preach about that. And we're going to talk about that tonight. And then the other one, dancing. Okay. Dancing. Particularly, we're talking about men and women, okay, where they would physically touch each other in this process. Whether it's, you know, waltzing, you know, to, to some soft music or, or slow dancing or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, going to a club or whatever, which there's a whole lot of details to that uh, that we could preach about. Some form of dancing, even just moving their bodies for other people to see, right? Maybe it's not touching, physically touching, but moving their bodies in such a way that uh, people to drive in movies because it started with the D. I'm, I'm kind of joking about that. But seriously, the idea of <coughs> movies was preached and then all the way back, 40s, 50s, whatever, however long people have been going to movies, Baptist preachers preached against that. Hey, it wasn't it wasn't just because Hollywood's evil, although a whole message could be preached about that. Okay, it was particularly what they said, because I grew up, you know, hey, Baptists don't go to the movies. How many of you guys have ever, I mean, I don't know, you, Baptists don't go to the movies. And I, as a kid, we watched movies. And so I thought, well, why can't they go to the movies? That's weird, you know. We go to Blockbuster, rent a movie, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, you can go to Blockbuster, but you can't go to the movies? It doesn't make sense. 
Do they even have blockbusters anymore? <laughs> I don't know. Place where you go buy videos, uh, uh, videotapes. No, I'm just <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm dating myself here. So I, I didn't understand that. It seemed like hypocrisy. You know, you watch movies and all that, but you know, oh, we don't go to the movies. We don't want anybody to see us at the movies. Well, that's hypocritical, right? Okay, but it was more than that. And so I was taught as a young kid, the reason we don't go to movies is because movies is just where people go to make out and to do, you know, be together with their, you know, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend. And I remember thinking, I, I grew up, you know, before I was saved or even after I was saved, we, was, we were still going to movies when I was a kid. I didn't remember seeing that, that that much, right? But I'll get to that here in a minute. So these are things we want to talk about. And if you look at our text that Brother Justin read, in the first verse, that's a great chapter, by the way, chapter on uh, dealing with marriage. And Paul even kind of gives some things in there that he's like, well, I mean, this isn't something you're going to find in the law. This is my thinking, of course, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But this is my thinking, not, not necessarily what God uh, is teaching for doctrine, but he says, uh, uh, but anyway, you read through that and there's a whole lot of great material. One of those chapters that if I'm just reading through my Bible and I go through that, I'm, it's so easily to get distracted and start trying to study that out and right, where compare scripture and, and everything. But the very first verse there pretty much sums up a lot of what he's talking about. It says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the hus husband render unto his wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. And then it goes on. But think about that, just that first verse. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay. Honestly, I believe that this is the, this is the key to understanding what, has been preached historically and what should be preached now in regards to these topics that we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Now, once people are married, you know, Paul makes it very clear this get married. If it's, it's okay, well, it's a wonderful thing to get married. Uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, Jesus talks about that uh, several places in the Bible. We can see where it's a good thing uh, to get married. If a man finds a wife, he's found a, that's a, that's a good thing. If uh, uh, you know, inside, how else could you reproduce and bear children and multiply and all that? So, so this is a good thing. God designed it that way. And He said, "Well, what about the marriage relationship?" Are these things bad? Can you not go places together? Can you not dance and all these kind of things? Well, look, Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. There's a place where God has given uh, men and women to have intimacy and to enjoy each other and enjoy these things, but it's in the marriage relationship. And I think once we understand that, we'll understand the problem with what's going on in the world and the, the way that they like to date and the way they like to go to these places and dance and, and go to movies and all that kind of stuff. And so this is the what's kind of seldomly preached on anymore, and I'm going to preach about it uh, tonight. Now, let me ask you this. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Does that mean that men should not shake hands with women <laughs> or high-five women? When I was going to Heartland, uh, I went to play a soft. We had a, I don't remember the, the occasion, but I remember we were playing softball. And, uh, and I just went, I was obviously married at the time, and we were, I wasn't living on campus or anything, but we were just there. And we were playing some softball, and a, one of these girls hit a home run, and she went around all the bases, and she came back around, and I said, Yeah! And she looked at me like I was out of my mind. Like, what are you doing offering me your hand? Don't you know we can't touch? <laughs> And so she did like an air high five. And I remember thinking, that's weird. What's wrong with high five? I wouldn't think anything of that, you know. But she was thinking, hey, we're not allowed to touch. That's one of the rules that the boys couldn't touch the girls. And so she's like, well, you know, so, so does that mean it's wrong? Now, I'll say this. Let me say this. Here, historically, in, in, in ethics, uh, ethics is not something that we, we talk about. Uh, talk about a whole lot anymore. Men taking off their hat, opening doors for ladies. You know what I'm talking about? But do you know if you study those types of things, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not ethics. Um, etiquette. Thank you. Proper etiquette is that if a man uh, wants to, sh I mean, a man doesn't go up to a woman 
no, you guys are going to be paranoid about this. <laughs> Don't be paranoid about this. The proper et etiquette, if you if you research that, is that the man never went up to the woman and offered his hand to shake her hand, right? He waited for the woman to do that. It was the proper thing. If she reaches out, then he can shake her hand, but it was kind of presumptuous for the man to, you know, maybe he's trying to take advantage of the woman or something like that. So I like that is something maybe to think about. If a guy just really wants to touch a woman and he's always trying to find you know, opportunities to do that, that's something that uh, you could see. But is it wrong for a handshake or a high five? No, I think that's, you're missing the point. <laughs> you know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. You're missing the point, okay? If you think, how about this, a woman's falling. <laughs> could you imagine a, a guy standing there and, and the woman starts to fall and he's like, oh, I better not touch a woman. He gets out of the way and she falls on the ground. <clears throat> now there's a story about my uh, my wife's grandpa who was being set up, and a woman was like you know scantily clad and and all that and came to the door or something and and she acted like she was fainting, and he backed up out of the way and let her fall and some guy this is the way I, I was told the story some guy jumps out of the bushes with a with a camera, and tries to take his picture they were hoping that he would catch this woman who was scantily clad and he'd get a picture of him in her uh, with this catching this lady and having her, her in his arms that's uh, that's weird okay but <laughs> whatever the case he let her just fall on the ground that time and, and the lord spared him from that <laughs> that bad image okay but no you could catch a woman you should be able to catch a woman uh i took a a, a lifeguarding class <clears throat> because i was a lifeguard there at camp sagmont where we go and they was the boys would swim separately from the girls <clears throat> but in the class uh there were some ladies that were taking the class as well as the guys, right? And I remember on some of the rescue moves, we had to do that to the women. Now, we did have some, uh, uh, because we right off the bat told them, hey, we're Christians, we're going to a Christian camp, and so all these things. So they let us come in uh, pretty much clothed. You know, we had, even the ladies wore something on over, like like a culotte type thing and all that. Anyway, they thought they probably thought we were weird, but... But we did that. But there were a couple ladies there. And I remember thinking, like, all right, so what would I do as a lifeguard? I've been taught not to mix swim, you know, not swim with ladies, uh, you know, because that's inappropriate and everything. But what if I'm walking about and I see some lady, you know, fell into the pond or something and <laughs> she's drowning? Is it wrong for me to jump in and rescue her? Absolutely not. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? It has to do with uh, what your thoughts are and what your intentions are as you're touching this person or you're trying to get into this situation that might cause you to be tempted to do something that might lead to fornication and uh and you got to be careful about that I, I remember another thing at heartland that they would do one of the rules was they call it the six inch rule not only could they not hold hands if they're a boyfriend and girlfriend but they couldn't be they couldn't sit closer than six inches right so if you were sitting together at chapel you'd have to be like you know okay <laughs> well you know we're not getting close enough and so what people would do is their boyfriend and girlfriend walking around the campus they eventually put a stop to this but they would hold like a pencil or some kind of a thing and they would both be holding this not touching it <laughs> isn't that ridiculous okay but uh <laughs> The idea, though, what we're talking about is we don't want to get to the situation where we're encouraging the appetites for the flesh in this kind of a, uh, in this kind of a thing. OK, so number one, let's just start with dating in general, OK, because the other two are going to come straight from the dating. Where are the two most common places that people go on dates? Well, they go to a dance, maybe a prom or a school dance or something like that. A lot of times that's what you think about a date. Uh, or they go to the movies, it's very common places that they go to dates. This is nothing new, and this is why this has been preached about for so long. Most examples in the Bible of uh, an espousal relationship, a, a, a marriage relationship, most of it is a sense in which they're betrothed to one another. Okay. In fact, the word espoused. Now, now if you look up espoused, it'll probably say married or something like that. But if you look it up in an old dictionary, 1828, or you go to uh, even earlier, somebody recently gave me a 1604 dictionary, which is kind of is cool, uh, where you can see uh, what, it's like the first dictionary. A lot of words aren't in there, but you look at that and kind of get an idea what it says. Well, if you look at that, it talks about people who are uh, betrothed or promised in marriage by a contract, right? So this basically means that they're legally 
married. They just haven't consummated their marriage yet. It hasn't been done, but they're by contract. Hey, this person's going to, it could have been somebody like, uh, uh, you know, Reuben say like, you know, Hey, he's betrothed to so-and-so. Now they might not get married for 15 years, but you know, they're by contract. I already gave, I, mean, I didn't, <laughs> but somebody else gave their wife to him to marry someday. They would be espoused. All right. Something like that. Right. Let me show you a couple of verses. Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. So where is he going? Is he saying we got to get back to uh, <laughs> betrothals and, uh, I'm just showing you what the examples are in the Bible and why we don't really have much about dating in the Bible. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, one of the places where you see the espoused. Luke 1, 26. And then, uh, uh, let me see here. Luke 1, 26, yeah. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou, uh, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And she, uh, 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 he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Uh, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there uh, shall be no end. And said, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? You're like, wait a minute, she was espoused to Joseph. Why didn't she know a man? Well, because the espouse doesn't mean that they were had already been united in marriage that way. It just means by legal contract, he, they were they were a couple, right? The days hadn't yet the day hadn't actually come. I think it was super close. I think they were supposed to be married, like any like like consummate the marriage uh, officially any moment now, and then this happened. Okay, so look over at chapter 2, verse 5. Or let's go to verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. All right, now let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Verse uh, 25. And then it says, And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so here this couple that was espoused, betrothed, if you will, by contract to be married, married, she was even called his wife for all practical practical purposes, but they had not yet come together in that way. And so this was a, is the case most of the time when you read in the Bible. I can't actually think of a case where there was any kind of what we would call dating today, where people get together or they court or whatever, but there was this idea of, uh, of a spousal period, okay? So this is why we don't really see dating and courting in the Bible. Okay, but by being against dating, when I say I'm against dating, if I were to say that or preach against that, here's what I mean. I am against sending your child, the person that lives in your household, right, and sending them off with a stranger, right, because this is the case. Like, you, you, you want to see how the world does it? Hey, who are you going to be with? Oh, some guy. Now I'm just using the scenario of a guy sending his, his daughter off. Okay. Oh, some guy, you haven't met him yet. Well, I want to meet this guy, right? So she brings him in right before they go out on the date, and he says, hello, sir, how are you doing? Shakes his hand, right? sends him off with this complete stranger, right? And they go off doing who knows what. And he says, hey, I want you back by 11 o'clock. And he's just hoping and praying the whole time that they're out that they're not going to be tempted to do anything and mess up and, and, and do something stupid, right? 
Well, guess what? They are going to be tempted to do something, right? And, his, and, and the whole idea, and again, you go back to the 40s, the 50s, it doesn't matter. They were doing this kind of stuff, all right? Sending their, uh, their child off with another person, uh, you know, hoping that they're not going to do anything stupid, which they are going to, and allowing them to go. And I've seen Christians today who otherwise have great parents, love the Lord, but they just like, well, I don't want to keep my kid from being able to do whatever I did. Uh, they, they should go to schools even, prom. They got like certain dances or whatever that they allow them to. And what they are saying is, I want them to be able to get all dressed up and fancy and have a girlfriend and take that girlfriend to the dance and be able to be together and, uh, and, and go out on a date. And so they will let them go with people who they don't even really know that well and let them get together. I'm against that. Okay, I don't think that that's good for anybody to just send your kids off and just hope they don't mess up. All right. But not only that, I don't even like the idea of dating in the sense that, I mean, you talk to the average person who's just totally fine with dating. And even in, a, even in elementary school or middle school, You'll, you'll hear kids talking these days, and they've been with, like, all these different people. I'm not talking about been with in a, necessarily in a, in a bad way, but they've been with, in these relationships. Oh, I had this boyfriend the other day, I mean, you know, uh, last year or whatever, and I dumped him and all this kind of stuff. And now I'm in this other relationship. And if you broke it down, they've been in a lot, lots of relationships, dating, what they call it, and because they feel like that's the thing that you need to do. And parents will even be like, well, you got to make sure it's the right one. So go out and try. I've heard people say, well, you got to go test drive, you know, the car before you buy it. And, uh, and, there, and I believe that the people, kids are learning at a young age to give their heart to one person and then be like, nah, never mind. I don't like you anymore. Now give your heart to another person. Nah, never mind. This isn't working. Give your heart to another person. Well, you got to do it. That's the only way to find out. There's lots of fish in the sea, you know. No, no. Here's what it's teaching them to do. They get to a point where they finally say, hey, this is the one, and then they get married, and they say, hmm, I just don't know why. I just not, I'm just not feeling it with this one, right? Why? Because they got a history of a lot of relationships they've been in that didn't work, <laughs> and they condition themselves to be like, you know, eventually, if it's not working out, we'll just break up and go find somebody else, right? So this is why so many people in the world end up in divorce, right? You got <laughs> the statistics are astounding. Now, they, I remember whenever I was a kid, they all said 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. That's huge, 50%. A little bit later on, people were saying, actually, it's moved up now. It's all closer to 60% of marriages end in divorce. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous, right? Now, here recently, I read something that said, actually, the divorce rate's gone down a little bit. It's more like 49% or something like that. I don't know. But you know the reason is? People just aren't getting married. <laughs> People were like, you know what? The marriage isn't going to work anyway, so why commit yourself and why get married? You might as well just live together. Eventually, if it breaks up, you just hope it doesn't break. You don't break up, but if you do break up, hey, you just go plenty of fish in the sea. Yeah, you taught yourself that whenever you were a kid and you were dating around, jumping around from this boyfriend, that boyfriend, you know, or girlfriend, whichever the case. I'm against that. And so when I am say I'm against dating, or I would preach against this concept of just going around dating and dating and dating to find this person, oh, I don't like them, uh, uh, testing everything out and seeing if that works. You don't find that in the Bible. And you don't find that, uh, you know, anywhere taught as, as, as that kind of idea being a good thing. I was thinking about this now, it was a diff different type of relationship, of course. But what about if we did that with our children, you know? Child's born. I mean, some some people in the world kind of have this mentality. Child's born, and you look at it and be like, yeah, "That's not what it was going to be. I will give this one back." <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have that luxury. Hey, once you're in it, you're committed. This is my child. I love this child no matter what. You know, um, we they asked us before because you know we're 43 years old and a little bit older for having children, and uh, and and so everybody like w reminds you. Hey, you know, the chances of having like a Down syndrome baby or something like that skyrockets whenever you're. <clears throat> so the doctor asked you about taking a Down syndrome test. And I'm like, we don't need to take a test. It doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> you know, if my child comes out with some kind of a deformity or handicap or whatever, we're, gonna, we're not going to love it any less. Right. 
And so, uh, so that's ridiculous. Well, I think that's what relation. Your parent, you didn't have a children. Sorry to tell you, this, you don't have a chance, a, a choice to pick your parents, did you? <laughs> you gotta love your parent, uh, regardless of what they do or what you like. If they do this, or you think you you think your dad's dorky or something like that. Hey, do people even use the word dorky anymore? That's how dorky I am. <laughs> you think your your dad's dorky? Too bad. You gotta love him. That's your dad. Okay. So this is how relationships work. They're long term, uh, you know, commitments. All right. But here's the most common, uh, probably one of the most common dates that people go on is dancing. To the extent of, and basic, by the way, this is in all different cultures. <clears throat> if you ever did like Duolingo or tried to learn a language, uh, it's just like almost every single thing they're teaching you is about going on date. I remember that. Here's one of the first Spanish phrases I learned. Tango una cita con Anita. Anybody know what that means? Tango una cita con Anita. I have a date with Anita. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other ones would be, you know, by, by law or whatever, going to dance or whatever. And so I have a date with Anita. One of the first phrases I learned, right? Because the culture is just thinking, hey, I got a date. I got a date and I got to go dancing and all this kind of stuff. Have fun. Go to the clubs. This is kind of the mentality of the world. And so one thing that they'll do uh, for a date is they'll go dancing. Now, I looked up because I knew this was a thing. I remember asking as kid, uh, being asked as kids. As a kid who was a Baptist by people that weren't Baptist, hey, how come Baptists don't like don't allow dancing, right? I mean, did you guys even know that was a thing? <laughs> Baptists don't like dancing, and so I looked up online something. I don't remember what I did, what how I typed it in, but something about uh, religion and dancing or something like that. And sure enough, there were all these questions: Why don't Baptists allow dancing? Well, really, that's an old thought because nowadays there's a lot of Baptists that are fine with dancing. No problems with it. In fact, I read several Baptists, independent Baptists, who were, who were kind of, uh, you know, defending it, saying it was no big deal. But historically, Baptists always preached against, against dancing. You know, I came across this article. Oh, by the way, uh, my, I mentioned briefly my, wife, my wife's grandpa, A.F. Collins, A.F. Collins, when he was when he was in uh, this would have probably been maybe in the 60s 70s I can't I don't know when it was exactly uh, but he was in Fort Scott at Grace Baptist Church and he had a radio broadcast and in his ra- and it was daily every day he'd be preaching something on the radio and he kind of got a reputation around the community everybody knew hey that's that guy that preacher on that radio station or they knew him from going to the church or something you know he was a, he was a big name influential in the community well, they were trying to put some dance hall in or something, and and, uh, and I remember he went totally against it. He went up to the council meetings, and he preached against it. He stood up against it on his radio broadcast. He he said things about it, which, by the way, that story I told you about somebody trying to set him up and the lady falling in his arms, this is when he developed all those enemies, whenever he was preaching against this dance hall uh, coming in. So this is something the independent Baptists have always uh, uh, preached about. But I came about this article... Uh, I don't know what the company, what the the site was. Uh, it was a popular site. I mean, a, a, a well-known site, but I just can't remember the name of the company. But they had an article that was called "All the Times in American History That Authorities Tried to Stop People from Dancing," and it goes back to the 1600s and all these cases, like on record, where they were saying, "Hey, you know, no dancing allowed," and different variations. And it went to the 80s. Okay, and here uh, was what it said about this in the 1980s, okay? In a rural Christian town in Elmore City, Oklahoma, dancing has uh, has been strictly forbidden since 1898 on moral grounds. In 1980, students from Elmore City High School initiate a proposal to overturn the ban so that uh, so that they can have a senior prom. The community's religious leaders have major objections. One Reverend F.R. Johnson from a church in a neighboring town is quoted in People's Mag- People magazine saying, No good has ever come from a dance. If you have a dance, somebody will crash it, and they'll be looking for only two things, women and booze. When boys and girls hold each other, they get sexually aroused. You can believe what you want, but one thing leads to another. Despite these objections, the students win the case, and the prom goes ahead. The event go on to inspire the 1984 cult film Footloose, starring Kevin Bacon. Now, when I was a kid, 
I watched the movie Footloose. I don't recommend it. Don't watch it, okay? I watched the movie Footloose. I remember a scene in the movie. And in the movie, there was this preacher. Again, it's based off of this real-life situation. And there was this preacher saying, I am against it. No dancing allowed. This young punk kid comes into town, and he likes to dance, and he's kind of a rebel. And it just so happens he falls for the preacher's daughter. I don't know if that's true to the facts, but... And he's trying to convince this reverend to allow them to have dances, okay? And they have some kind of court case about it. Now, here's a quote from the movie Footloose, okay? Here's what this young guy says. He's trying to fight for the liberty to be able to have this school dance. And he opens up his Bible, okay? And he says this, From the oldest of times, this is a movie quote, this isn't real life, okay? He says, From the oldest of times, people danced for a number of reasons. They danced in prayer or so that their crops would be plentiful, or so so their hunt would be good, and they danced to stay physically fit, and show their community spirit, and they danced to celebrate. And the dancing we're talking about, aren't we told in Psalm 149, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, let them praise his name in the dance. And it was King David, King David, who we read about in in Samuel, and what, what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? Reads again. David danced before the Lord with all his might, leaping and dancing before the Lord. Leaping and dancing. And then he says, Ecclesiastes assures us that there's a time for every purpose under the heaven. A time to laugh and a time to weep, a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. And there was a time for this law, but not anymore. See, this is our time to dance. It is a way of celebrating life. It is the way in which it was in the beginning. It is the way... It will always be, it has always been, it's the way it should be now. And lo and behold, they decide to go ahead and allow the dance. Hey, that kid has a good point. David did dance before the Lord. Well, <laughs> here's a major difference, right? I, I remember thinking as a little kid reading that saying, what does that got to do with David? Here's a major difference. David was dancing before the Lord, <laughs> right? These guys were dancing. And look, the movie shows it very clear so that they could be affectionate toward one another and seductive one toward another, and which led to being physical with one another. And all that had nothing to do with dancing before the Lord. But let's go ahead and go to 1 Samuel 6 and see that story. 1 Samuel 6. Well, what about dancing? Is dancing wrong? Well, here's the problem with those people that try to make this argument about whether or not dancing is wrong. They're missing the whole purpose of why people preached against dancing, why, uh, you know, why uh, dancing could be wrong. And they just try to throw out all these arguments from the Bible. First Samuel chapter six. Look at verse 12. <clears throat> I th- I'm sorry. Second Samuel. Second Samuel six. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. That's a religious... I mean, you know, you didn't see these kids, these teenage kids that wanted this dance. They weren't, you know, doing some offering to the Lord. <laughs> there was nothing about that. That's what David did. And look at verse 14. David danced before the Lord. Now, it said, just said how he was joyful. He was so glad that the, the Lord's, uh, you know, the ark had been back into Jerusalem. And so he's happy. So what is he doing? He's leaping for joy. He's dancing for joy. Right? I don't know what that looked like. Uh, If you study it out a little bit in the culture and even what the word means, you know, there was a lot of like skipping and leaping and and twirling around and stuff like that. This is the kind of dancing we're talking about, okay, out of excitement. But not only that, and it says uh, he's dancing with all his might and he was girded with the linen ephod. Not only that, but keep reading. So David and all uh, all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David... Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And look at verse 20. Then David returned to, his, uh, to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, 
How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids and his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. So even in this context, you see that the dancing could have been a bad thing. I'm not saying he did wrong and dancing for joy and leaping for, but you see where she, who was already kind of despising him for other things, but she's looking at him and saying, hey, he's like one of the vain fellows dancing himself and he's uncovered and he's not painted. Look, there's nothing in the Bible that just shows like, hey, you know, being in an intimate kind of a dance or going to the club, that type of dancing is okay. Going to a prom, hey, I'll never let, uh, my kids are homeschooled anyway. Uh, it'd be kind of weird to have a school prom <laughs> for homeschooled kids, but I would never send my kids to a prom. I would never send them to uh, uh, some kind of thing where they could dance uh, and all that kind of stuff. I, I, there's no good that come, could come out of it. You said, well, you're old fashioned, man. Even in the 19, uh, 1980s, they realized, you know, this is, this is what well, day before that, they were preaching about that for a long time. And I stand behind all those guys that say no good can come out of it. Uh, we don't need any any dancing going on, okay? So let me uh, finish with number three, which is the drive-in movies. Now, we don't really do drive-in movies anymore, uh, but the concept of the drive-in movie was, hey, you can stay in the car, you just pull up, and there would be a big screen out there, you know, and you'd watch the movie from your car. And so you can imagine, all right, the idea of what people would do, they would take their boyfriend, uh, the, the boyfriends take their girlfriend and they would go this driving movie. Hey, we're going to the movies. We're just going to watch a movie. And they're in a parked car and the climate of all the other people. And they're, they're not watching the movie, if you know what I mean. And so it's dark and they're in the car. Who knows what uh, they're watching? But the idea was for them to be alone, be intimate with one another. And so, you know, they could go to just park and watch the sunset going to be the same idea, right? They're just looking for an occasion to get alone and to do something uh, that they shouldn't do. And so the idea of what they're watching on TV or is the movies wrong in the sense of should you ever watch something from Hollywood? Should you ever put a movie in? Like that's another message for another day, okay? But in this context, the reason preachers always preached against going to the movies was because they, they understood the movies to be a place where people would take their date and they would go and, uh, and they would, you know, sit in the back in a dark movie theater with the movie on, and they would just look at that for an opportunity. Come on, you've all seen the movies where the guy sits next to the girl and goes, <sighs> puts his arm around her, right? That's stereotypical. Right? Everybody knows that that was, the, that was the motivation behind getting the girl to go somewhere with them where they could be alone and do all that. One, just like that preacher said, one thing leads to another, and it's just an opportunity to, be, to find yourself in a tempting uh, place where you can, can do that. All right? And I'm not even going to spend any more longer on that. I think you understand. All these kind of go together. The idea is if you're not married, you know, you're going to try to keep yourself from any situation uh, where you would be tempted to do something. Now, the Bible says a lot about fleeing the whorish woman or the woman that tries to flatter, the woman that tries to go after you men. Run away from that, okay? Those kind of women are going to, uh, are, are a deep ditch, the Bible says, okay? But not only that, you could get into a relationship with somebody and try to, uh, you know, hey, you could have the best intentions. I've seen it happen to a lot of people. I even struggled with it myself, okay? So I know what that's like, that you have the best intentions. I don't ever want to do wrong to uh, the person that I'm dating. Uh, I said dating, you know what I mean? The person I'm in a relationship with and, uh, and that I want to marry or whatever. Uh, I remember with Valerie, I won't get personal, okay? But I remember the closer I got to marriage, it was almost in my mindset like, I know we're going to get married. We're practically married anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, in that mindset of saying, hey, what's the big deal? And so you got to be uh, careful about that. Now, carnal Christians will make fun of you. They'll make fun of you for having these views. Oh, that's so silly. That's so, so old-fashioned. Hey, you're adding things to the Bible. The Bible doesn't say you can't dance. The Bible doesn't say you can't watch movies and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but the Bible says a lot about the intention of the heart and a lot about how uh, looking at a woman to lust after or or uh, or how did it say uh, if you touch uh, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. So that's the that's the idea. What could what could be better for a marriage relationship than getting to this point? And I, I remember my mom telling me whenever I was when I was younger, um, well, I guess I was a teenager, 
And I would have this kind of debate with my mom saying, there's nothing wrong with holding hands. You're not doing anything wrong with holding hands. She said, yeah, but you hold hands. One thing leads to another. And then you got the affection there and you're wanting to do something else. And you're wanting to do something else. And then I remember thinking, well, that's silly. You know, anybody can hold hands and it's just because you love that person you want to be with them. Well, I can tell you firsthand, you know, once you hold hands, sure enough, you know, hey, we're holding hands. It's exciting. And the next thing is you want to do something else. And so I have seen people, I, I can't say this myself, uh, it's not true about, about me, but I have met a lot of people who, who went to the altar to be married. And in their marriage relationship, they were able to look each other in the eye and know in their heart they had never even touched before they got married. And you say, oh, what is that? That's some kind of weird, you know, cult-like teaching or something like that. No, that's called purity. That's called, I mean, can you imagine the first time you're with your spouse and that you ever touched each other or had those kinds of uh, uh, intimate relationship was the, whenever you're consummating your marriage. Uh, it would be a, a wonderful thing. And, and for anyone to think, well, I got to know what it's like before I make the final decision. That's just wicked. And that's what's called fornication, right? And it's this idea of I need to know before I get married. Sex before marriage or that kind of a thing is a fornication type of an idea. And we don't want that. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, he's speaking kind of metaphorically. Because if you remember, several times the marriage relationship is a picture of our relationship with Christ. Okay? And uh, I think everybody in here understands that. And so in 2 Corinthians 11, he's using this kind of a metaphor, but I want you to notice what he says in verse 2. Oh, man, I'm in the wrong book. 2 Corinthians. eleven two. now that you already read it. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I think at the very least, people ought to commit themselves to say, hey, I am going to stay pure until marriage, uh, until marriage, if for no other reason, right, because that picture of being pure before Christ and being presented to, uh, to your husband uh, as a chaste virgin. Okay, and so uh, and that ought to be our goal. That I know that's what I want for my children, and I know that's uh, hopefully, you know, obviously some people in here have no doubt messed that up in their past, but this should be the case for everybody who enters into that kind of relationship. Keep the long-term uh, vision, you know, in your head. Don't get to this point where you will sacrifice uh, something that would, that, you know, a lot, you would you would sacrifice for instant gratification something that's going to have long-term consequences that mess you up. Keep yourself pure and keep yourself for your future spouse. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message. I don't know where it applies to anybody, but I pray that you would uh, use it and bless it. And I pray that you help us to keep ourselves pure and help us, uh, help me as, as a Baptist preacher to, uh, to be able to preach about things that maybe aren't even popular to preach anymore or people in the world might think, uh, it makes us weird that we have these views. Help me to be able to give a reasonable answer and, and convince people and show them from your word uh, what you desire from us and maybe even uh, a little bit of just common sense. And, and uh, Lord, I certainly uh, can see the blessings that come from having a, a, a pure life and being presented to a spouse, having been pure and chaste and virgin. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to do that with our, our children, present them to their uh, spouses pure, and I, pr I pray that you'll help us spiritually to do that uh, with Christ as we um, live, try to live a holy life separated from the world and uh, live clean before, uh, before God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.